Monday morning, family. It's Lady Mara with this week's VP News and Views. Children's Church takes place every Sunday following praise and worship, excluding Fifth Sundays. Fernan Park, we celebrate Christian marriages. Trusty Fred and Brenda Williams, 26 years on July 11th. Gerald and Elizabeth Ford, 10 years on July 13th. Calling all men, join the Men of Destiny, third Saturdays monthly, 12.30 to 2.30. Ladies, the Women of Purpose are inviting you to come out and chillax and play games. Saturday, July 15th, 12.30 until 2.30 in the Admin Commons area. We're asking all ladies to bring a game and a dish of your choice. See you there. Are you looking for ways to grow more together as a family? If so, the Vernon Park Missions Ministry is excited to announce the Summer 2023 Fast, Families Actively Serving Together Outreach Initiative. During the months of July and August, families can sign up for specific dates to serve at the Bread of Life Food Pantry in Inglewood and also Feed My Starving Children in Schaumburg. These service opportunities are designed to be a fast and impactful way to spread joy while serving together as a family. The immediate family with the most recorded service hours will receive a family fun package that will strengthen the family bond. Spots are filling up quickly, so don't wait. Visit the ministry table to reserve your fast spot today. It's that time of year again. Mother Car's farm shares are now available. See a member of the farm team directly following service. Half shares are $275, whole shares are $475. Again, see a member of the farm team to sign up for your shares today. We are a family that prays together. Please keep the names on our sick list in your prayers. Sister Deirdre Dee Dee Farrell. And pray for our bereaved brother Rick Allison, Sister Wanda Parker, and Sister Deshonda Sisko, and the loss of their uncle and great uncle Daniel Allison. Wilfred Jordan, the brother of of Sister Jennifer Jordan. Well, family, that concludes the video announcements for VP News and Views. Thank you for joining us. And amen. Woo! I mean, watch your Bible for the Church. Let's lift them up really, really high and let's, uh, with those same wonderful voices, proclaim this affirmation. God said his word to me. Introducing it today. So, this will not um, be very uh, long. As a matter of fact, I won't even get to Galatians 6. Um, but I want to speak on the subject ready, willing, and able. Amen. Um, I want to examine how, even though you're living in some serious issues, you can also live in the kingdom as well. And then you get an understanding of our culture and how it affects everyone. So today I'm going to talk about culture and consequences. Amen. I need Vernon Park people to know what's happening around me. Amen. If you know what's happening around you, you can deal with it better. And you don't have to be surprised. So our key scripture for the next three to four weeks is Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 and verse 8. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 and verse 8. Let's honor God by reading the word together. Very familiar scriptures. And realize this is just our introduction. Pray for those that um, have some issues. I understand uh, there's some issues on the Bishop Ford this morning. There's some bad flooding and uh, some people cannot get through. Uh, so we, we're praying for them. Amen? Amen. Amen? Let's all read together. And the Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, 
and the train of his robe filled the temple. Go to verse 8. The Bible says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Turn to your neighbor and say, Neighbor, neighbor God can send me. God can send me. Amen. Amen. Some of y'all shouldn't have said that probably. But anyway. <laughs> I must choose my words, Mark Harris. Sometimes you're called to assignments that you just don't want to do. They're outside of your comfort zone. Somebody say comfort zone. Everybody got one. A comfort zone is a place or a situation where one feels safe or at ease and without stress. Your comfort zone is where life difficulties are at a minimum. Some of y'all like that spot. Some of y'all comfort zone is in Jamaica. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Sometimes God ignores that, though. Yes, he does. God will beckon you. You talking kind of loud, Brother Bruce. <laughs> Some of y'all know God will beckon you to come to a place that you're not comfortable in. Amen? Amen. To give you a couple of uh, key phrases today. I uh, won't be very long today, but I want y'all to get deep into this. The first key is this. It's possible to function in simultaneous realities. Yeah, yes, it okay. is. It's, it's possible to work or exist or operate in more than one place at the same time. Uh -huh. yeah. What is reality? Reality is the totality of things and events. It's everything put together. Some of y'all got a lot of reality happening right now. It's a lot of stuff. And you've got to actually categorize your, your realities. You got your kids stuff. You got your other family stuff. You got your work stuff. Some people got money stuff they got to deal with. And you deal with it simultaneously. Done at the exact same time. It means you have a special skill. And some of that skill is actually translated spiritually. There's a man named Isaiah. He was a righteous man. But righteous folks have to deal with things as well. And the Bible says it was the year that King Uzziah died. And he said, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. This is one line about more than one thing happening at one time. I want to talk today about a couple of things that are reality. The first thing is the reality of culture. The reality of culture. What is culture? Culture is the customary beliefs, the social forms, the material traits of a racial, religious, or a social group. If you don't understand anything about America, understand culture. Yes, sir. Understand culture. It'll help you to understand things that are going on around you. Yeah. We define cultures by generations. I grew up in the 60s and part of the 70s, so I'm part of that culture. Yeah. Nowadays, they don't call it by years anymore. They just call them by alphabets. Uh -huh. the X gen I think it's an X generation. Which one is this one? The Y, the Z? Which is We're in one of them right now. <laughs> this is Z. All right. There's a great saying. I love this saying. You might write this down, put it on your refrigerator. Read with me. We do not choose our cultures. We belong to them. You don't, you don't choose the culture you're in. I would not choose this culture for me. Because I grew up in a different one. But I'm in it right now, so I got to live through it. Amen? Sometimes culture makes you uncomfortable. Sometimes culture goes against the grain of everything you believe. But if you're in it, you're in it. Turn to somebody and say, you in it. You in it. Knee deep. What does culture say? Culture is the voice of a generation. Culture is the rhythm. It's the rhyme of the time. Now, here's the thing about black folk, which most of y'all are. Some of you may not identify as black.
All black folks don't function as the same culture. Yeah. Can I say that one more time? Yeah. All black people yeah. don't function in the same culture. Yeah. True. Judge Coleman. Now they may put us all in the same bag. They may treat us all the same, but black people are different. Yep, yeah, yeah. Because in every culture, there's something called a subculture. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A subculture is a cultural group that's inside a larger culture, right. often having beliefs or interests that are variants for those of the larger culture. There's black people that don't think like the majority of black people. Uh -huh. right. Those are called the subculture. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You have subcultures in church. Everybody come to church, they may serve the same God, but there are subcultures inside the church. Yeah. In every culture, there's a subculture. In schools, there are subcultures. Yeah. And you go to high school, there's the jocks, yeah. there's the nerds, there's the smart people, there's the other people that are not so smart, <laughs> there's the folks that are popular. Those are called, they all go to the same high school, walk across the same stage, yeah. but there are subcultures. Yeah. And everybody don't belong to those cultures. Yeah. There are 46 million people in the United States of America that actually say they are black. But when you look at where the black people are in America, you realize they're spread out. Only 10% of black people live on the West Coast or west of the Mississippi. Only 17% of black folks live in the Northeast. Only 17% of black people live where we live, in the Midwest. The majority of black folks live down south. 56% of African Americans live in the south. I saw some of them in Texas. <laughs> and if you take your Midwest culture down south, <laughs> y'all already know? There is a southern culture and there's a northern culture. Even in church, there's an east coast culture and a west coast culture. And they are totally different. It's our view of things that cause us to respond to things around us. And so this is introduction. And this is talking about the reality of culture. Let's now talk about the reality of consequence. What is a consequence? A consequence is an outcome. It's the effect of. It's the aftermath. It's the upshot of whatever happens. Consequence. For every action, put your hand in the fire. And so the reality, there's always consequences to everything. I love this saying. Read it with me. You have the freedom to choose but you're not free from the consequences of those choices. America. America, you've got the freedom to choose anything you want. Say anything you want. Be anything you want. But you are not free from the consequences of those choices. And that's what I want to talk about in my remaining 19 minutes. Just a little bit. Just an introduction. And if y'all digest this well, I'll get deeper next week. In, in the book of Chronicles, 26 and 3, Second Chronicles, I need you to read these verses with me from 3 down through 5. The Bible says what? Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. No term limits. Verse 4, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. He sought God during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. As long as he sought the Lord, 
God gave him success. He was 16. He became the king. He was the leader. He was the leader for more than 50 years. He made the choice as a young king to seek after the Lord. Verse 5 said, he sought God during the days of Zechariah the prophet who instructed him in the fear of God, treating God as God. And the Bible says, as long as he sought the Lord, as long after he attempted to find God, God gave him success. This man was bad. He built up the economy of this nation. It became a very secure economy. He built up the walls of that nation. His army became strong. And all of this happened during his reign. And look here, he made the choice to follow God. And what was the consequence? Success. Very simple, it was success. Here's where the story turns. Last key. Altering culture does not alter consequences. Altering culture does not alter consequences. America. What does it mean to alter something? It means to change it. Just because you change the culture does not change the consequences. Cause it to change. Cause it to change in its character, its composition. Ch causes it, you, just, you change it by one word or one sentence. But if you alter it, does not mean you alter the consequences. Here's a man in government. This man represented the government of his nation. Didn't say he was perfect. Never said he preached. Don't talk too much about his church attendance. But he was faithful to God. And as long as he sat where he sat in government, and he honored God, and he stayed in the place where God had put him, the Bible said he was successful. But something turns in his life. Turn to 2 Chronicles 26, verse 16. Read with me. The Bible says, but after Uzziah became powerful, stop right there. Sometimes power corrupts people. If you don't know the purpose of a thing, you will abuse it. If you don't know the purpose of a good woman, you will abuse her. If you don't know the purpose of a good man, you will abuse him. If you don't know the purpose of children, you will abuse them. If you don't know the purpose of pharmaceuticals, you will abuse the drug. He abused his power. The Bible says, after Uzziah became powerful, what happened? His pride led to his downfall. I wish I could preach about pride today. I'm going to get that alone. What changed the nation? Pride of his heart was at the bottom of his sin. It's a lust that ruins many people, many nations. Go down to verse, the second part of verse 16. Let's read that. The Bible says what? He was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Ah! Church and state. Separation of church and state. I wish I had a little time, Pastor Chen. The priesthood, if you remember in scripture, as well as the kingship, were both appointed by God. God put both of them in their place. God sets up leadership, both in government and in the house of God. These were separate and independent systems. God has set them up. But here's what this man does from his throne in government. He decides, I'm going to change the church culture. I'm going to change what God has set up in his house. Understand that one system cannot take over the functions of another system. That's how God does it. That's why uh, I was asked, uh, not only here in, Col uh, in Illinois, but also in Colorado. Uh, when I was younger in Colorado, I was asked to run for state senate. They said, you will win. We set it up. We vetted you. You're very articulate. You're very popular. We believe that you, a lady named Erin Taylor, she was a black uh, state senator in, in Colorado, and she came to me personally and said, look, I need somebody to take my place, baby, uh, and, and you can run, run, run and win. 
But I said, I can't do both. I can't be the preacher. This is just me. I can't be the preacher and, and the senator. After I became pastor of Harner Park, I was approached by the Democratic Party of Illinois to run for Congress in the state of Illinois. This before anybody else had gotten in the race. They came to see me first. 9-11 South Stony Island. Sat in my office. I felt pretty good until they told me what they wanted me to do. I thought, I felt good. Charles, I, all the poor people came to my office, the Jewish people, the black people, skinny people, fat people, they was all sitting there in my, in my office. And they said, sir, we've been vetting you. You can win a state uh, representative's position, and we're going to back you. Don't have, to worry about, don't have to worry about raising any money. We got you. Just for a second, I thought, ooh, -wee. <laughs> Congressman January. <laughs> Good parking spaces no matter where I go. <laughs> and I said, I can't do both. I, I can't be both the pastor and the congressman. I can't do it. Other folks can do it. I'm not talking against it. But, but I know God sets up both, and I'm not schizophrenic. Culture. We can, we can alter culture, but we can't alter God. Can't alter heaven. Can't alter this word that's in your lap. You can try America. I love this saying by France Fanning. Read this wonderful saying. He said what? Destroy the culture and you destroy the people. That picture was taken in 1968. Black men and women, strong together, Afro, Seen just flowing, just. <laughs> men love women, women love men. Yeah, we had problems, but we were together. But if you destroy the culture, you destroy the people. I only got 11 minutes. Let me try to finish this up. When he runs into the church, uninvited, he runs to the place where the priests are, where God is set up, where the fire of God is. And the Bible says that he goes in and he wants to light the incense. This, this is a wrong thing. Read with me verse number 18. The Bible says what? They confronted King Uzziah and said, It's not right for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. Stop right there. There's something that, that should be said about here. 81 men of God stood their ground and said, sir, you can't do this. I know you are the president. I know you're the head of everything. You're the cause of why the tides are so good in my church. My people are all working. Unemployment rate is way down. You're the reason why we feel safe. Our borders are safe, because you built up the army. You're the reason why things have happened. For over 40 years, sir, you've done this. But this is not your spot. This is not your house. You can't do this. The fire you want to burn is unauthorized. I wish I had time to preach about unauthorized fire in God's house. He said what? They said what? Leave the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful, and you will not be honored by the Lord God. You've been unfaithful, and God does not honor unfaithfulness. All my life, God, you've been faithful. And God calls us to be the same to him. And here's a man that knew success because of how God had been faithful, but he had turned from God. And when a nation begins to turn from God, they begin to attack the very concrete, the very foundation of faith in that nation. When God is not enough, man says, now I'm God. Just like I give amendments to the Constitution, I will now give amendments to the Ten Commandments. And when they are confronting him, the Bible says he becomes angry. And when he becomes angry, he's angry because the men of God says you cannot change the culture in God's house. Bible goes on to say in verse 19, Uzziah, who had a censer in his hand ready to burn incense, he got mad. He got angry. He began to protest about God and about God's house. How dare you speak to us this way? How dare you say this? I'm the government. 
I'm the people. America. Read with me the rest of verse 19. The Bible says what? While he was raging at the priests in their presence before the incense altar in the Lord's temple, leprosy broke out on his forehead. I wish I had time to talk about what happens in the Bible when God mocks your forehead. In scripture, in 20 seconds, let me just say this. A mark on the forehead in scripture means not only identity, but it also represents destiny. He could have put the leprosy on his back. But in the midst of him arguing with God, in the presence of God, the scripture says leprosy broke out on the king's forehead. In the midst of his rebellion, God marks him. Listen to me, America. He never lost his kingship. He never lost his throne. The nation was still wealthy. The army was still strong. But the head of the nation was marked. Now, when you get a chance, you Bible students, I want y'all to run over to Amos chapter 1, verse 1. And what you will see in Amos chapter 1, verse 1, is what else happened during that day. It, it, was, it was Josephus who said, and you'll notice, and, and it, it talks about Uzziah there, but it, it talks about there was a day where there was such a horrible earthquake that the mountains around the village began to shake. Josephus said that happened at the exact same moment God marked that boy's forehead. When God marked his forehead, the nation shook. America, be careful. Be careful. Our nation is shaking now. We've been marked with leprosy. He doesn't lose his throne, but his image is tainted. His legacy is tainted. The honor is off of him. Can I give you one more scripture? Read this with me. Second Chronicles 3, 6, 21, the Bible says what? King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house, leprous and excluded from the temple of the Lord. He never loses his throne, America. He never loses his army, but he's separate from the glory that could be his. Because what he had was an infectious disease. It was COVID on steroids. They put him in another house. It was beautiful, but he did not have the same glory as where he was. He had to sit on another throne. Matthew Henry, that great theologian, I love this saying. Read it with me. Kevin, we get ready to get about it. Here. Henry said this, those that covet forbidden eyes forfeit allowed. The word covet means yearn to possess something. There's a reason why the Bible says, thou shalt not covet another man's wife. The power of covetousness can ruin not only a family, but a whole community. Sometimes even in church, we covet a position we were never called to. Those that covet forbidden honors forfeit those that God allows. The word forfeit means lose or be deprived of as a penalty for wrongdoing. Close your Bibles. I hope this is enough of an appetizer uh, to, to ask you to come back next week so I can get deep and we can talk about cultures and consequences. Also talk about how this young prophet said, here I am, send me, Lord. Send me. Volunteering for the impossible. Being ready, raising your hand, being sworn into the army of God. When others say it's a suicide mission, send me, Lord. Send me. But always remember this. Alter your culture does not alter consequences. 
Things happen because they happen in there. We want to thank y'all for watching us today. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being strong enough and brave enough to hear the truth. I'm not the only person that tells the truth, but I believe that there is a hunger for lies today. People want to be entertained. People want to be tickled. Ain't nothing funny about what's going on around us. I thank God for joy. It's my strength. But this is a crisis situation. And God sends his answer through his word, and he uses his people to make a difference. Are you willing to make a difference today? There's a number on the screen right now, and uh, that number goes to our offices here, our prayer team. We'd love to pray with you and or for you today. Please call that number if you desire prayer. Uh, if you even desire to become a member of our congregation, whether it be in person like the folks around me right now, or digitally, we, we take you in and cover you and send you some information. We'd love to talk to you. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. God bless you. Stay safe. I give our audience a hand as they go. And now it's time to give. Those of you that are watching our broadcast online via Facebook or YouTube, if this is your week to give your tithes and offering, you may do so via PayPal or Tithely. You can also mail your payment into our post office box located in the city of Glenwood or Come up to the church office during our office hours, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. And if you're visiting with us, please be sure to give your tithes to your church home. However, if this ministry has been a blessing to you and you'd like to sow a seed in good soil, we'll be sure you will receive a receipt for your contributions. God bless you. You can give through these portals on the screen as well. And thank you. The Lord bless and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Let's say amen and may God bless you.